The Lord be with you. With your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Fear no one. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. I know that some of you have heard this story before, but given what our gospel is today, I thought it'd be nice to share it again. For most of my adult life, I've been shaving my head, mostly because it was easier. Didn't have to go to the barber, make an appointment, I just cut it myself, got looked in, had like this shaving mirror and I would do it, you know, even behind my neck and all that stuff. Certainly saved on shampoo. When I first came to St. Mary's, every time I would cut my hair like that, Father would see me the next day, Father Pistoni would see me in the rectory the next day, and he would go, did you, did you cut your own hair? I'd say, yes, Father, I did. Say, you need a pastor's haircut. You go down to the Seagros and they'll get you straightened out. <laughs> so in honor of his uh, 50th anniversary, I grew out my hair and I went to the Seagros and I got a real haircut. <laughs> so I think our Lord has a sense of humor that then today happens to be the reading where we hear, even all the hairs of your head are counted. And if you've heard some of my homilies before, you know this is one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture. I often make reference to it even when it's not the gospel for the day. In this line, even all the hairs of your head are counted, I see a great summary of both who God is, who we are, and then our relationship to God. So on the one hand, we have this description of God himself, of what he's able to do. So we know that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And for this reason, he is able to number the hairs on our head. This is knowledge that even you and I don't know. Um, I, preparation for this, I looked up on Google, how many hairs are on the average human head? And according to Google, most of the responses I saw was about 100,000 follicles of hair on the average human head. Who knows how many are on your head? You probably don't know. And if you did count it, maybe there's better things to do with your time. <laughs> but God knows, and he is om omnipotent and he's all-powerful. That's one of the functions of his love. That's why he's able to love us the way that he loves us, because he's all-powerful. I don't have the time in the day to do that. I don't have the energy to do that, but he does. And so his capacity to love us is increased by virtue of the fact that he is God. Likewise, it tells us a little bit about ourselves. We are a mystery often to our own self. Like, we don't know how many hairs are on our own head. It's our head. Who knows us better than us? And yet there's information about ourselves we don't even know. But of course, hairs on our head are trivial. There's a lot that is less trivial, that is more profound in our souls, in our being, in our psychology, in our makeup. All of that which is often a mystery to us. 
There are things that I know about myself now that I'm 36, kind of wish I knew when I was 16, but it, those 20 years in between have been uh, me discovering all of this stuff. And of course, God in his relation to me, revealing that to me. So we work uh, as, as the process of salvation is worked out. Because salvation is a process. That's why we receive sanctifying grace at our baptism, but that's not the end, it's just the beginning. And so things like the mystery of our own self, it's one of those things that we're working on with the Lord, and He in His love helps us in that. So then we come to the relationship between the two. We talked about God, we talked about us. Another attribute of God I want to add is like, He is omni, and I'm just making this up, but omni-interested. I talked about om omnipotent and omniscient, but it's like he is very interested in all things because he has the capacity to be. Everything that exists is being held into existence by his intention. If God simply stopped caring about something, it would simply disappear. You know, I put together a, a chair that's in the rectory. You know, I assembled it myself. But if I stopped caring about it, if I stopped thinking about it, it would still be there because it's not dependent upon my caring, my interest in it. But things that exist are not that way for God. God can't forget about something and then it still is exists, existing. He holds things actively in existence. So part of God's interest in us and his relationship to us is that profound interest in us because he has the capacity to do it. Our, the way that we relate to God is as a creature to our creator. And this is different from any other kind of relationship that you and I are in, you and I could ever possibly have. It's something that we have to discover it's something that we can read about, especially when we read the lives of the saints, when we read from sacred scripture. We understand how that relationship works a lot better, and yet we do have to discover it for ourselves. Any analogy that we might use, any metaphor for our relationship with God is always lacking in some regard. Now, analogies are helpful because they might shine a light on one little aspect of that relationship, but all analogies are lacking when it comes to our relationship with God because it's perfectly unique. And so one of them that comes to mind today is something I've heard often here in a homily, a priest talking about our relationship with God. And they'll say, God, uh, speak to God and relate to God as if he were your best friend. I've heard that probably a million times. Speak to God, relate to God as if he were your best friend. Now, there is some goodness to this analogy. I will admit that. Often, the priest is using it to get people away from the idea of the disinterested or distant clockmaker God who set things up in one point and just has forgotten about it. So it's talking about, like a best friend, you know, have a relationship, talk with him, uh, express your feelings with him. All of that is good. That's, that's all good stuff. But of course, I have found it over the years very lacking because I should hope that your relationship with your best friend is not anything like your relationship with God and vice versa. I mean, so I, I had a visit from a friend of mine who joined the, the Franciscans, and he was home on vacation, and... Um, we, we were hanging out this week. He, we went out to Safe Harbor. We went out fishing, and it was a lot of fun. We talked about a lot of stuff. We caught up. You know, what have you been doing since I saw you last? I think the last time I saw him was Christmas. Um, it was great, but that relationship is nowhere near as deep or profound as my relationship with God. And it would be inappropriate for my relationship to be him with, to be like that between me and God. So the best friend analogy doesn't always work, especially when we consider the way we communicate with God. You know, when I talk with my friend, we're, I'm using air pushed through my lungs that's vibrating the air waves, that's hitting his ear, he's interpreting that, et cetera. It's a very limited amount of communication. I can't talk to my best friend with the stirrings of my soul. But I can do that with God. In fact, that's the primary means of our communication with Him. 
God is so profoundly interested in us because of his capacity that we can speak to him with the interior movements of the soul. That even what we think, how we feel, and everything we lift up on the altar of our heart, all of that becomes the way that we relate to him. And in return, God speaks to us usually in a way that's very different from a best friend. Now, God can, if he wants to, and sometimes we see it in Scripture, sometimes in the lives of the saints, he can come and appear to us and speak to us. He can send a, an angel, a messenger, to speak to us. He can send a saint to speak to us. That could happen. But ordinarily, day in and day out, our relationship with God, he speaks to us through enlightenment in our soul and through his very creation. Because after all, he is holding creation in existence. He is the God of reality. And so our contact with that is him expressing himself to us. And it takes faith in order to understand and see it. So that's why our relationship with God is different from our relationship with our best friend. It's a good analogy in some ways, but in other ways it's, it's lacking. We relate to God as a creature to our creator. And we have a God who knows us better than we know ourselves and who loves us even more than we love ourselves because his capacity to do all of those things is much greater than ours. This is a great mystery. And yet it's what we enter into every time we pray and every time we come here to Mass. The one whom we love and the one whom we seek, this God who is, should be and is at the center of our hearts. This is the one who loves us and knows us better than we could ever love or know ourselves.